And we'll start in seven, six, five, four. Buen día a todos. Gracias por acompañarnos el día de hoy en este webinar donde abordaremos el lanzamiento del flagship de transporte y resiliencia climática en América Latina y el Caribe. Contamos con interpretación simultánea de español a inglés e inglés a español y puede ser configurado en el icono del mundo en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Paso la palabra a Graham Watkins, jefe de la División de Cambio Climático del BID, quien nos estará compartiendo su mensaje de apertura. Muy buenos días a todos. Um, I'm going to speak in English, if that's okay. Um, I'm Graham Watkins. I'm the head of the Climate Change Division in the IDB. And I'm really, really happy to be here. Uh, the launch of this, really one of the first big studies on looking at climate change and transport in Latin America and the Caribbean. So I, I think this is a really very important step forward. I wanted to mention that this has been developed in full collaboration with uh, various groups, including the International Transport Forum, the International Association of Public Transport, the International Road Federation, the International Association of Ports and Harbors, uh, and Air the Airports Council International the Latin of Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and I, the representatives of those groups are actually going to be joining us for the panel discussion. But I wanted to say a couple of words to begin with. One, one I, I'm Normally, people look at me and they say, well, why are you so excited about climate change and what's happening now? Because everything sounds negative all the time. Uh, and I'd like to point out that actually things are looking very positive right now. And the reason that things are looking positive is that the change is being driven more by opportunity and economics and new technologies, uh, which are very powerful national drivers of change. So countries are actually buying into this idea that the, the changes relating to climate action are actually positive. They, they bring benefits. And just this morning, I was reading the BBC News and I see there's a big article on BYD Auto, uh, which for all of you that don't know it, is a, it's a Chinese company uh, that produces electric vehicles. But uh, Warren Buffett, who's quite a well-known US investor, actually bought a 10% stake in BYD Auto and he bought it in 2008. And what he said at the time was that This is going to be the largest player in the global automobile market uh, that is inevitably going to go electric. The only question is when. Um, and so you're aware why it's it's exploding right now. It's It produces a, its lowest price uh, electric vehicle is about 11,000 US dollars. Uh, Tesla's is about 36,000 US dollars. And BYD Auto sold about 270,000 of these last in September. So just to get, get an idea that there, there's change happening and it's starting and it's beginning to move forward. And just to give you another example, yesterday we approved what I think is sort of a model uh, policy loan for the Dominican Republic. And one of the biggest features of that policy loan was actually the question of ensuring resilience in road systems, ensuring bridge design actually incorporates resilience measures, climate resilience measures. This is, it, it, it's starting to move and it's starting to move very quickly. And for that reason, I just wanted to also mention very quickly, you know, we, we really are committed uh, from the climate change division, from the bank, uh, to some of the key messages in this report. I mean, what, what is that climate action is no longer an environment issue. It's transversal. It cuts across energy, transport, land use, agriculture, social issues, finance, and, and basically how you construct institutions. And the second is that it's long term. You need to think about the change over like a 30 year period. Not It's not about change next year. It's about thinking about how do you plan for the change over time. Uh, second big message is that it's country specific. You can create a sort of a model about how you what changes you need to do, but each country is going to be different. They're in different places, there's different starting points, uh, and they're going to move forward, but they need that help to look at what are the barriers to change, what policies and investments do we need to move change forward. Uh, and the third is to repeat this message that this is not just about risks, negative news, impacts, and costs. It's actually much more about opportunities, about what are the benefits that come from these changes? What do we gain actually by ensuring climate resilience in the long term? I know it's going to cost more upfront, but what do we gain from that? 
and, and how do we move forward with some of these new agendas? I'm going to stop there. I hope that wasn't too long, but but I'm, again, just to repeat, I'm super excited about the report, about the direction we're going in, uh, and I'm going to pass to Agustina, who I, I must admit that is one of the people that sort of began some of these discussions about, you know, how can we be innovative and look at new technologies quite a long time ago. So I remember some of the presentations she organized several years ago. So I'm going to pass to her and give her the word. So muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Raham. Thank you for uh, your um, uh, opening remarks. Um, I'm going to switch now into English. In this conversation, we will be switching from English to Spanish, so I encourage you to use the interpretation if you need that. Um, entonces, eh, gracias, Graham. Ahora, en esta parte del webinar, lo que vamos a hacer es presentarles eh, los muy rápidamente los eh, resultados de este informe que ustedes ya pueden des descargar tanto en inglés como en español en el chat. Entonces, eh, bear with me just for one second. Uh, voy a uh, poner en presentation mode, que ahora lo estarían viendo. Eh, entonces, si tuviéramos que resumir en muy pocas palabras el mensaje de este informe es que es tiempo de actuar, y eso lo decía Graham en sus palabras de apertura. Porque vamos a ver que cumplir con el, el objetivo del Acuerdo de París exige una reforma estructural del sector transporte, y el BID tiene el firme compromiso de ser un socio en este cambio. Por ejemplo, todas las operaciones de préstamo del grupo BID deben estar alineadas con las trayectorias de bajas emisiones. Y con el estudio que lanzamos hoy, la región cuenta con pri por primera vez con un análisis integral sobre transporte y cambio climático. Y les presentamos en este estudio las estrategias para av avanzar en esa transformación verde del sector. ¿Por qué nos importa el sector transporte en la lucha contra el cambio climático? Porque es un cuarto de las emisiones globales de CO2 y también estas, lo ven en el gráfico de la, de la eh, derecha, en el color rojo, estas se han venido duplicando en los últimos 30 años. Ahora, contextualizado América Latina, las emisiones del transporte en realidad tienen una, reducción, una participación reducida a nivel mundial, son solo un 2% de las emisiones globales de CO2, pero en América Latina y el Caribe se han venido incrementando radicalmente estas emisiones, si bien un poco lejos de la aceleración que han tenido, por ejemplo, los países asiáticos que ven en las barras en azul, América Latina, un 112% en los últimos 30 años, y hoy las emisiones del transporte constituyen el 40% de las emisiones totales de CO2. Si miramos a los diferentes modos de transporte, estas emisiones provienen en su mayoría del transporte por carretera, especialmente del transporte de pasajeros a nivel urbano e interurbano, lo cual, y lo ven en el gráfico en las barras de la izquierda, es muy similar a la tendencia que tienen otros países en desarrollo. Y otra tendencia que es muy importante para los países en desarrollo es el acoplamiento que existe entre crecimiento económico e intensidad de las emisiones del transporte. Entonces aquí un mensaje para la audiencia es que tenemos un gran reto de cómo seguir creciendo para reducir la pobreza y la desigualdad en la región, pero balanceándolo con la transición energética. Y entonces... Esto es reconocido en el Acuerdo de París cuando menciona dos palabras muy importantes, que son transición justa. También hacía mención Graham en sus palabras de apertura, porque esto implica que debe tenerse en cuenta el contexto económico, social y también medioambiental de cada país, porque al final el 50% más pobre representa apenas el 12% de las emisiones, y entonces se requiere... Un, la adopción de un enfoque gradual para los países en desarrollo. Esto tiene un corolario importante para la región, los países deben seguir invirtiendo en infraestructura y servicios de transporte para alcanzar los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible que nuestros colegas han calculado en un 1.4% del PIB hasta 2030. 
y debemos hacerlo a la par que apostamos por un nuevo modelo de transporte, y estoy segura que los speakers luego hablarán también en este sentido, donde lo que tenemos que hacer es ciertamente reemplazar combustibles fósiles por energía renovable, pero lograr un transporte que sea sostenible, eficiente, seguro e inclusivo, que provea acceso a oportunidades para todos, eh, y les vamos a mostrar más adelante qué sugerimos en este sentido. La mirada integral tiene que ver también con el otro lado de la moneda, que es la adaptación de nuestro sector al cambio climático, donde la frecuencia y la severidad de los eventos climáticos extremos se han incrementado radicalmente en los últimos 100 años. Ahora, ¿qué pasa si no hacemos nada? Bueno, en el informe les presentamos escenarios eh, para las diferentes eh, redes de aeropuertos, puertos, carreteras, y por ejemplo, ahora lo van a ver en la pantalla, en el caso de los puertos de América Latina, van a ser los hubs a nivel regional los que van a estar más afectados, y estos hubs son los que conectan las rutas de comercio de América Latina y el Caribe. Y del lado de las emisiones, si no hacemos nada, estas se van a incrementar en un 17%, mientras que para estar en línea con el objetivo del Acuerdo de París, deberíamos reducirlas casi a la mitad para 2050. Entonces, les decíamos al principio que es tiempo de actuar, los próximos dos años de acá a 2025, ya estamos a menos de dos, son cruciales para revertir esta tendencia y debemos enfocarnos en generar ese enabling environment a partir de priorizar la lucha climática contra el cambio climático en los planes sectoriales, desarrollar los instrumentos de políticas, adaptar las instituciones y formar alianzas, porque a 2030 ya tenemos que haber llegado al pico de las emisiones del sector y estar en la senda descendiente para cumplir con los objetivos que tenemos en el Acuerdo de París. Para esto, los países cuentan con diferentes mecanismos que están establecidos en el Convenio Marco de Naciones Unidas sobre Cambio Climático, y algunos seguramente ustedes los habrán escuchado, lo, las NDCs, ADCOMS, NAMAS, LTLETS, NAPS, NAPAS. En el capítulo 3 de nuestro informe los desarrollamos en detalle y vemos cómo está cada país con cada uno de estos mecanismos. Pero aquí les quiero dejar el mensaje general, porque nos análisis nos muestra que no siempre el transporte es priorizado en estos documentos y cuando lo está, normalmente hay una desconexión con la política interna, lo que lleva a que terminen siendo objetivos un poco más aspiracionales, lo cual está muy bien, pero pocas veces se materializan en acciones concretas. Ahora, buena noticia, tenemos la oportunidad en 2024, eh, porque de cambiar esta situación, porque va a haber un proceso de revisión de las NDCs que abre la ventana para que seamos más ambiciosos y alinear las políticas públicas nacionales con esos objetivos climáticos que se establezcan en las NDCs para el transporte. Las acciones que implementan los países líderes, y en el capítulo 4 del informe hacemos un gran barrido y análisis de esta de estas acciones en diferentes modos de transporte, nos pueden ayudar a trazar una hoja de ruta para el sector. Y para ello volvemos al enfoque sistémico que les comentaba antes, promoviendo la movilidad sostenible de las ciudades, la descarbonización de los modos aéreos, férreo, marítimo y terrestre, fortaleciendo la resiliencia climática de los sistemas e impulsando la innovación y la transformación digital, lo decía Graham al principio, que tiene un importante rol que cumplir en la sostenibilidad del transporte. Pero esto el sector no puede hacerlo solo sino que debe coordinar con otros sectores que también tienen mandato sobre el cambio climático, especialmente medio ambiente, a nivel país, y es quien establece los objetivos climáticos a nivel país, por supuesto con el sector energía, desde donde se necesitan generar esas nueve fuentes de energía que sean renovables, e industria y comercio, entre otros sectores, para generar la oferta de nuevas unidades que sean más limpias. Los países disponen de cinco instrumentos para generar este cambio, que son regulaciones, procesos de adquisiciones, instrumentos de precios, incentivos no financieros e inversiones propias, y lo pueden ver en detalle en el informe. Algunos de los países de la región ya 
usan estos instrumentos. Tenemos países que, por ejemplo, están liderando la transición hacia flotas eléctricas en el transporte público, pero lo que necesitamos son políticas eh, por las cuales, los, eh, independientemente del estado en el que se encuentre, y nosotros los clasificamos en cuatro, para que estos países puedan pasar de ser jugadores de nicho, seguidores rápidos o países rezagados en la transformación verde del sector. Y para eso en el informe proponemos hojas de rutas adaptadas a los diferentes subsectores y al punto de partida de cada país. Por cuestiones de tiempo, aquí voy a mostrarles gráficamente la hoja de ruta para la movilidad urbana, donde ante todo se requiere una planificación integral del uso del suelo y el transporte, la priorización en la lucha contra el cambio climático, en los objetivos de los planes de movilidad, los incentivos para la gestión de la demanda y la transición energética, modificaciones a los esquemas de compras públicas para, por ejemplo, viabilizar modelos de negocios de flota eléctrica e inversiones en transporte activo, infraestructura de recarga, soluciones basadas en la naturaleza, entre otros. En el de, como les decía, en el estudio incluimos el detalle de las acciones de política y también el horizonte, no todas se tienen que implementar ya, pero ¿cuál es el horizonte para implementarlas? Ahora, seguramente ustedes se estarán preguntando cómo financiamos esta transición. Bueno, para ello tenemos que aprovechar las fuentes de fondeo vía cargos directos a los usuarios, cargos a los beneficiarios indirectos y ciertos fondos que han probado ser efectivos a nivel internacional. Así también como las fuentes de financiamiento, especialmente los fondos climáticos de los cuales como BID somos canalizadores. Un dato a destacar aquí es que los montos disponibles, lo ven en el gráfico, han crecido exponencialmente de 2020, pero son escasos si los comparamos con las grandes necesidades del transporte. Por eso en el informe les proponemos medidas para mejorar la eficiencia de la inversión, generar nuevas fuentes y apalancar inversiones del sector privado. Entonces, con esta presentación muy rápida, yo quisiera agradecer a todos los autores que participaron, a los especialistas de las diferentes divisiones del banco, a nuestros socios que están hoy representados a través de los panelistas aquí convocados, eh, por este estudio que es un primer para la región, que está también disponible aquí en la pantalla, en el chat, y ahora le quiero pasar la palabra a Ana María Pinto, jefa de la División de Transporte del BID, para continuar con este webinar. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias, Agustina, and thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for, for, for being here today. Um, I'm going to switch to English. Most of our panelists speak English, so and then and then we will switch to Spanish in each of the maybe of the answers. So um yeah, I mean thank you. This was a great presentation. Thank you for to Graham for like supporting us and be uh and give the opening remarks and and, and help and work together in, in this agenda. Definitely this has been something that we've been working as a division for many years, but now we have the the opportunity to put this together in 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 one place and and so and more than that look forward look ahead of what is coming for the region so i think as a bank we got this kind of responsibility to be this enable and enabler and help all the countries to to keep a uh, progressing towards a more cleaner agenda and and of course the some the transport sector we have this unique opportunity uh, to get all the actions and policy together to move in the, in the right direction. And um, I just wouldn't like to take more time. Uh, I would like to present the, the our panelists, leaders in the region, in the world really, on, on in the transport sector and, and, and uh, representatives of these very important institutions that are doing very important things around transport and climate change. So, um, Thank you, thank you for joining, and it's my pleasure to to present here today Stephen Perkins. Stephen, thank you so much for being here. He's the advisor to the Secretary General of the International Transport Forum. Susana Samarato, Susana, great to see you. Is the Director General of the International Road Federation. Dionisio González, gracias Dionisio, is the Director of Advocacy and Outreach of the International Association of Public Transport. Rafael Echeverne, Echeverne. Uh, Rafael, 
the Director General of the Airport Council International for Latin America and the Caribbean, and Ingrid Sidenvall, Director General of the Global Maritime Forum. Uh, so I would like to start the conversation for by asking Steve, Steve, how do you see Latin America and the Caribbean in comparison to other developing regions towards achieving the Paris Agreement goal, specifically for the transport sector? Hi, Steve. Hi, thank you, Anna. Thank you, uh, Agostina, for the, for the presentation of what's a really excellent report. I think the, the strength of policymaking in Latin America is the traditional focus on inclusion and safety and interventions to make mobility more equitable and to make roads safe for pedestrians and cyclists are exactly what is needed to decarbonize transport. And I explain why I say that. Uh, to meet the Paris Agreement goals, which are gonna be very tough, we have to reverse the shift towards car dependency. Electric vehicles alone is just not going to be enough. So we need better public transport and we need much more space allocated for people to walk and to cycle space that is safe. The majority of people in Latin American cities already depend on walking and public transport for their daily mobility and their lives need to be made much better with much better services. Um, public transport and cycling have to become modes of choice, not modes of last resort. So city governments across the continent from Mexico to Buenos Aires are doing a lot to improve things. And this has accelerated uh, since COVID and that's been well documented in the current report and previous IDB reports. Um, the other cornerstone is funding public transport. It's a critical issue, uh, including to electrify buses. And city governments in Latin America typically have very weak revenue raising powers, including to fund improved public transport. But there's opportunity and both Santiago and Bogota have demonstrated the really great opportunity to reform the whole concession uh, set up to get funding into public transport from the power sector. The national government of Chile led the way here uh, with a complete overhaul of the concession model adopting best practice from Singapore and from London. And this model separates ownership of the vehicles from operation of the services. And that enables more sources of funding to be able to invest in the buses and into electric buses. It also set this separation also allows regular competition to run improved services and it keeps the authority for the routes and for service quality clearly with the government. And that confusion over who's responsible for what is, you know, plagues public transport services across the cities in Latin America. It's a great model to replicate across the continent. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for like th those reflections. And definitely, um, public transport is the way, but we still need lots of things to to resolve in order to make it like sustainable, and um. Susana, welcome to IDB virtually. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, great to see you uh, again. And uh, my second question uh, goes to uh, to you. And the, we don't have a specific like measures of a specific um, indicators of the road sector itself. But how do you see the road sector uh, at the international level? moving forward in mitigating greenhouse emissions. Thank you very much, Anna Maria, and I hope you can all hear me well. And greetings really to all of you, uh, fellow colleagues uh, on the panel, but also all of you who are uh, connected today for this important um, conversation. And, and let me spend a few seconds just to really congratulate IADB for the launch of this important piece of work. And, and a thank you to uh, Anna Maria, Agustina and the team for the opportunity as well to share some reflections, not just my reflections, but the reflections of the International Road Federation um, and a global organization based in Geneva, Switzerland, that operates us since 75 years. This year we're celebrating our 75th anniversary and an organization who has been assisting um, really public private sector, anyone in, in, uh, in the mobility and, and roads uh, arena by fostering that knowledge and expertise sharing and dissemination, by connecting people and by working on policy and advocacy. And I'm, I'm making this introduction, not just of course to promote my own organization, but also 
so that you can put in context uh, what I will be um, saying. I um, I, uh, I appreciate the presentation of, of Agostina and also what just uh, Steve was, was saying about the need for us to um, shift to a much higher level of, of concerted action between us and especially this public private sector if we if we if we are, are to deliver on 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 this uh, challenge and and that requires really embracing uh, that type of system thinking that Agostina was having in one of those slides when she was talking about how do we really rethink uh, transport um, and land uh, planning and, and use and the partnerships as well. And it's fantastic. This is a testimony, uh, this this report on the way we, we can work together. Um, I pretty much agreed with Graham as well on the excitement. Um, yes, we have challenges, but there's also a great opportunity for us um, to uh, really develop and embrace a systemic vision of, of change. And, and that requires, Steve has just said it, and it was one of the key points I wanted to make, uh, not just replacing fossil fuels uh, with electric power, but really uh, embracing uh, a, a much wider change. Uh, something that we try to to do with um, um, a road sector for COP27 joint statement, um, what the, some of the organizations in the road sector were trying to articulate their thoughts around uh, these, these issues. Um, the first one is that um, this is not this is not about roads or uh, another models of transport. This is how do we deliver efficient multimodal transport system and services where actually roads, um, yes, need to decarbonize, but we need to do that in a way that doesn't compromise services that we provide and without undermining a network that actually serves any other modes of transport. Uh, including active mobility and public transport. And so this means vehicles, yes, electrification and much more, but thinking about infrastructure as well, which is all, often the poor or the, the forgotten child in all this uh, conversation. There's a lot of work that we can do on infrastructure now. We do have the means uh, to do that. We know we can quantify 80% of the carbon footprint when in and roads projects comes from materials, for example, and the transport of those materials. We know how to abate those, those emissions. And so what we need is really policies and tools and a reform probably of procurement if we want to change the scale and the pace of this important transition. I'll stop here because I already spoke too much. <laughs> Thank you, but I hope we're coming back to this. Definitely. Thank you. Definitely, Susanna, and yeah, very well said about the role, that the important roles that that roads and road like transport has for like the economy or, and all the services, and it's not just one one or another, no, like zero or or everything or, or nothing, no, and it's like a process on how we we embedded this in a holistic approach. Um, now my my question goes to Rafael and Ingrid, Icao and M I M A O set international goals for the aviation and maritime sectors. Um, how does the region stand towards achieving those goals? It's something that we focus a lot on public transportation and road transport, but sometimes we overlook these two sectors that of course are very important, uh, so a little bit more sophisticated sometimes, and no, not everyone like know the details about it. So thank you, Rafael, for being here. And please go ahead in English or Spanish, whatever you prefer. Ingrid or Rafael first? Uh, go ahead, Rafael, and then we go. Okay. To All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, well, aviation, uh, likewise, likewise is, is, is a key uh, spec for the development, social and economic development of the region, of course. I mean, uh, road transport is very important, but of, course, but of course, to be competitive, of course, you need the fast uh, and immediate access to to these uh, countries and these uh, these economies, um, the challenge when it, when it comes to aviation is the availability of SAF sustainable aviation fuel. We are talking a lot about electric aviation. This revolution taking place, and that is obviously very welcome news. But we know for a fact that if we don't have SAF sustainable aviation fuels, we are not going to go anywhere. Okay, so that is. I would say the most the priority when it comes to, uh, to to the region, because right now there is zero <laughs> stuff being produced in Latin America right now. 
the interesting thing about it is that we have incredible resources to produce that. Okay, so that is that is something that the, the governments actually have to look into it. Looking specifically into the airport section uh, sector, which is the one that I'm more familiar with, what I can tell you is that airports are really making huge inroads into this. Uh, th there is one um, uh, um, initiative called the Airport Carbon Accreditation, which is actually uh, run by ACI. ACI is my organization, the International Airports Association. Um, it is a worldwide um, initiative. And uh, we actually have uh, Latin America being very, very active in this, in this initiative. We have right now approximately 72 airports participating in this initiative. And basically what this initiative does is to, first of all, measure the CO2 emissions that are generated at the airports, and then looking at taking specific steps to reduce these emissions. And we have, uh, you know, levels one, two, three, four, and now we are working on level five. Um, we have three types of, of, um, of emissions, what we call scope one, which are the emissions generated by the airport itself, scope two, which are the emissions generated with the electricity, electricity that the airports buy from the grid. And then, of course, we have a scope three, which are the most challenging ones, which are the uh, uh, emissions generated by the aircraft, okay? I mean, airports themselves cannot really impose anything on the aircraft. That's why I was saying that SAF is so important, okay? But when it comes to the uh, uh, emissions generated by the airports themselves, we do have a specific plan through this airport carbon accreditation. And as I say, we have more and more airports participating there. And we would like to congratulate airports like, for example, Bogota, which have already reached level four in this, in this plan. So that's the situation right now. Big challenges, but indeed airports at least are working very, very specifically on this. And I know that airlines want to work on this as well. The challenge is getting that uh, available to you of that, of that, that stuff. Thank you, Rafael, for the importance of, of balancing and, and working together with the private sector. I think you outlined it very well how this is no just yeah one one act of responsibility. So how you need to to get a, and in the airport sector, a, the private sector to be able to help with the with the policymakers to make that change and, and the opportunities that we have still in Latin America to move in the agenda. So now, now we switch to Ingrid. Thank you for being here, Ingrid. Uh, could you tell us the same about the, the, the same question about the maritime sector, please? Yes, absolutely. Uh, good morning and, and uh, thank you, Anna Maria. And, and thank you so much to the IDB for, for inviting me to this panel. Um, and yeah, I, I would like to congratulate the IDB for, for, um, for the report uh, that you presented um, a little while ago, I think it's, it's really important to highlight the role of transport in, in climate mitigation. Um, and I, I really appreciate the, the emphasis that was made on, on synergies between the different modes of transport and also with other sectors of the economy, uh, and also the need for policy coordination, because that's something that really resonates with us in the in the maritime space as well. Um, so, uh, Earlier this year, the International Maritime Organization uh, adopted a revised greenhouse gas strategy, uh, which uh, sets a target of uh, full decarbonization by 2050. And it also uh, sets some quite uh, important interim targets. So there's both a fuel uptake target for 2030 and then emissions reductions targets for 2030 and 2040. And why is this significant? Well, I think that first of all, by by moving from a target of 50% reduction to full decarbonization, the IMO now sends a signal that uh, the sector will need to change uh, fuels. So, in order to reach a 50% reduction target, you can you can come quite far by um, efficiency measures, but to fully decarbonize, you actually need to change fuels. So that's an important signal to the sector. Uh, and the interim targets, they also indicate that this transition really needs to start now. We cannot wait until we get closer to 2050. It really needs to, to happen now. So I think that for the Latin American region, there are a couple of things that are significant with this change. So one is, and this has been touched upon by, by previous speakers as well, Latin America is a region that has a, an amazing potential to produce uh, the, the new 
um, heating fuels, so zero emission fuels. Uh, and the region also um, has a, a good uh, strategic uh, location with access to 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 two oceans. Um, and I think that uh, the uh, the demand signal that has come out of the IMO is significant, so showing that the sector will be needing those fuels. And I think that for Latin America, uh, this means both that the the region can produce the fuels and uh, and offer them for bunkering uh, in in the region itself. But there is also an export opportunity because these fuels will be needed all over the world and a few regions have the same uh, potential to produce them as, as Latin America. Um, something I would just like to come back to is that we have this ambitious strategy now. Uh, we have an important demand signal, but in order to really unlock the potential of, of the region, uh, we need to see um, stringent policy measures being adopted by the IMO, so the, the UN Agency for, for Shipping. And that's uh, the that's what's next on the agenda for the IMO delegates over the coming two years. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you for the reflection about the importance of, as well, the opportunity that that can bring as well for the, for the region as a provider of cleaner fuels. And, and again, the work that the private sector can do as well to kind of take this opportunity um, and the importance of public policy to uh, and regulations to, to make all this happen. And, and with this, I would like to pass to Dionisio. And Dionisio, the, the public, when we talk about climate change in Latin America, like lots of people, we ought to think that about public transport and public transport is the big solution for everything. And we already seen in the report that it's a part, a very important part, but a part of it. And still a part that needs consolidation, and that that still uh, there is there is like a lot of, a lot of challenges on on really uh, making this a, a the main mean mean of transport for many in many cities. So how do you see really the region? And now that you can like you from your organization, you see different regions what's happening, uh, Asia uh, like moving a lot uh, on a lot of tra on on public transport. How do you see that? the chief from the avoid chief improve paradigm how do you see latin america and the caribbean moving on that chief to public transport muchísimas gracias es, es un placer eh, estar aquí con uh, con vosotros con todos ustedes queremos agradecer en primer lugar la, la amable invitación de, de del bid a participar en este estudio y felicitar al equipazo de Agustina y a su equipazo, y por supuesto, bajo el liderazgo de Graham y de, y de, y de Ana María. ¿no? Eh, I would like also to thank the UITP team, uh, especially Philip Turner and Arthur Comer, and of course, uh, UITP members, EMT Madrid and Iberdrola, who worked also in this, in this peer review. And let me, let me start with a very positive message. Yeah? As a whole, I, uh, the region is, uh, is making progress, uh, but always more can be done. Yeah? And this uh, sounds uh, quite familiar. Yeah? And also with a personal remark, I, I very much like uh, and sympathize um, how you are addressing the situation in Latin America, uh, because somehow advanced economies grew based on, on, on carbon intensive model. So today we here in the region shouldn't be blamed for that. Yeah? It's also true that we, we should find ways to reconcile economic growth with energy transition, but the starting points are always quite uh, relevant. Uh, as we have heard from, uh, from Agustina, it's evident that the countries in the region generally don't consider the transport sector in the way to offset climate change. And in the few cases where they do that, those actions are not really accompanied by specific sectorial goals or uh, any type of monitoring uh, progress. So where I, where I do want to go, yeah, to, to say two things, uh, that indices should be much more ambitious and much more cleverly managed. Let me very briefly explain those, those points. When I talk about more ambitious, uh, what I mean is that we should focus, as you addressed in the question, on the shift pillar. Avoid pillar is uh, long-term planning, not always appreciated by politicians. Improve pillar, to my point of view and to our point of view at UATP, is uh, overused. It's not a question of technology, as already we hear from uh, Stephen Perkins. Uh, it's, it's a matter of technology and how we distribute the urban space 
in our cities. So shift is a crucial element. And for that, you need integrated multi-level, long-term vision, institutional framework, and this is important, to have public transport authorities or even better mobility agencies. And this is not the case in, 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 in most cities of the regions. We do need also strong policy reforms. We are talking here about e-buses and the potential of e-buses in a market where in many places, more than 50% of the trips are done by paratransit or informal transport and up to 80 or 90% in uh, in many cities. Yeah? And we do need also a stable funding framework to strengthen investments in public transport and, and infrastructures and services. Uh, from our point of view, again, the demand management tail is still far away in most countries. It's first, is if we don't have first a, a very basic public transport system. To finalize, uh, when I talk about more cleverly managed, as you mentioned, uh, in Bogota, in Santiago, but also in Ciudad de Mexico, in Lima, in Montevideo, where we have members, and only with a few exceptions of Argentina and Costa Rica, those impressive public transport strategies and projects to reduce uh, the mobility carbon footprint, they are not included into the indices. So it's there a, a big lack of coordination between local and national instruments. Thank you. Thank you, Dionisio, and, and thank you for highlighting the importance of institutional arrangements for for like moving the, this agenda. I mean, the, there are lots of good technical solutions, but without strong institutions, this this cannot be can be not be done. And, and definitely we have challenges on that on that issue. Um we still have, I mean, we're doing great of time with time. Thank you, everyone. So I would do the, re the next round of questions, and I would just ask you to do one minute per answer so we can get everyone for this next, next round. So um, I go back to Steve, and Steve, um, I would like now to talk about small and medium-sized cities, and particularly uh, those that are lagging behind. No, we, we see these like big movements in big cities and lots of resources and, and priorities, but we still see that the, the small and, and, and middle-sized cities are, are left behind. Um, what examples do you have maybe for the region and, and, and more than that, recommendations on how we can help these cities as well to move in the right direction? Okay, well, it's not very fair to pick and choose from cities, but uh, I'll, I'll just take a few examples at different scales. If we drop one step down from the capital metropolises and we take a city like Guadalajara in uh, Mexico, population of 1.5 million, 5.3 in the whole region, that's still, Mexico City is still five times bigger than that. So it's, you know, it's a big city, but it's not the, the biggest by a long way. They're following pretty much the same policies as uh, Mexico City based on equity and safety, but they've achieved more. Um, and this includes professionalization of private bus and microbus operators. The point that uh, UITP was just making, so much of the services provided by these small operators, you have to improve the way they work and make them uh, professional in terms of their employment conditions and the quality of their vehicles, but also the way that they respect the routing that's been assigned to them. And basically they're, they're concessioned in a, in a way of a, of a heavy bus system. Um, and there's been a, a complete reorganization of the bus routes in the metropolitan area of uh, Guadalajara and Zapopan. Um, they've implemented an electronic bus payment system to make it easier for the multimodal trips that uh, we need to make in a, in a more uh, effective public transport system. And they've renewed two thirds of the bus fleet already with cleaner vehicles. And they're operating the first 100% electric bus line in Mexico. And they've got the longest, busiest BRT line in, this, in the country. And they've just opened a third light rail line connecting the metropolitan centers across the region. So, you know, they're a secondary city, but they're doing really well because of the strong governance that they've set up between the state and the local and the, and the city authorities. And the reallocation of space from cars to public transport and pedestrians in the urban centers is really noticeable. And so is the shared public bike system and the bike lanes that run right across the metropolis. So if we drop to a smaller scale, and focusing on the safety part uh, of the conditions for low carbon mobility, there's a lot of promising examples right across Latin America, often with uh, NGO-led technical urbanism that's in close collaboration with the local authorities. 
So we drop half the size again to Fortaleza. It's a very well known, very well documented by IDB example uh, with, for example, safe streets for schools uh, and similar initiatives working with the Prefectura. Um, in the city as a whole, half of the students go to uh, school on foot, but for the areas that have been treated under these programs, you know, over 80% of the parents reported they have no access at all to cars. So tackling these kind of trips is, is, is vitally important. And in the last half of the last decade, they saved uh, 756 lives in Fortaleza, which puts them completely on track to meet the sustainable development goals of halving uh, road deaths in the decade in their jurisdiction. Um, and this kind of program is brought out across the region by Vital Strategies, now supported by Bloomberg. There are other initiatives as well. If we go down to a smaller example again, Dispatcher working on very similar assists, uh, systems with the Ibo Mikaye program. Across the region, for example, in Palmyra, near Cali in Colombia, a small city of 350,000. Again, in close collaboration with the municipal government, these um, urban uh, interventions. They're equally relevant in the rural areas as well, where typically there are no pavements to get to schools uh, in a lot of villages. And again, they're, they're great examples right across the region, um, too many to, 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 to talk about. But the overall conclusion uh, for me is that decarbonization doesn't always require big budgets and definitely not advanced technology. And there's a complete interlinkage between the safety, equity, mobility, health and decarbonization policy agendas. So there's massive scope for improving on all fronts at the same time. Thank you, Steve. And thank you for reminding us that it's not just about the, the 2030 or 2050, but providing betting services now and that road safety is still a, a big challenge for our cities now uh, and, and getting better conditions. So I, I would like to talk a little bit now about resilience because we, we talk about mitigation and how the re how can the region decarbonize, but the reality is that we are one of the regions, Latin America and the Caribbean, that is more affected by the, the, the effects of climate change. And, and that's something as well that is a reality now. So I would like to ask um, Susana first, uh, what, I mean, now that we have all this stream weather and all the threats infrastructure in infrastructure, what are the main, um, yeah, challenges that we have and that what is need, needed to reduce these, uh, the risk of disruptions and, and, and the effect of on, on our infrastructure. Thank you, Ana Maria. I, I think I can, I can give a very straightforward answer when it comes to uh, pure operations point of view. So the technical part uh, before I, I, I mention, I reconnect quickly to what we were discussing. Um, for us, uh, extreme weather events, it means uh, really embrace the command and control type of approach. Um, but I have to say that it's not, uh, people have to understand it's not always possible for an operator um, of a highway, for example, um, to do that. Because sometimes uh, the decision, and often the decision um, to close uh, national um, national roads because of an extreme weather event like a snowstorm or something lies within another ministry. It's not the Ministry of Transport, it's sometimes the police. And so it comes back to this initial point that I was making, system thinking and their coordination part. So we need to have in place coordination mechanism, uh, which are not always there right now, and or they are there and they are not working as they should. Then linking back to the point I was making about the system and the other speakers have said it as much, you know, um, Steve was just mentioned, this is not just about transport, it's, it's, it's about a lot of other things. And the system thinking and action uh, make you think that, you know, response to your answer is, it's not just road. So systemic visions, it means reinforcing the resilience of the entire transportation. Um, and each one has to do its part, of course. You need to know what are uh, your key assets and um, what kind of risks are they exposed to, um, how, well, learn sometimes to manage to, uh, to manage the level of risk and how you do that by the monitoring, by adapting infrastructure. And one important point, which very often in the road sector we miss out um, on, 
uh, it's extremely important that you maintain your secondary network if you want to ensure continuity of service when there's a massive failure, for example, on your main uh, artery or a highway. And, and this is something that really um, is, is not very often uh, brought to the table as a, as a conversation. Then, of course, when an event, of course, you have to have in, in place procedures, coordination mechanism. But this is one po important point on which I think Stephen was also um, underlining. The people, we need to have the skilled people in place who know what to do when this, kind, this type of, of events do occur. Uh, finally, as well, a point on this um, on, on this and on the positive side, um, digitalization and the arrival of new technologies can make wonders in that respect, because we have now tools that allow us to um, track, uh, collect data and know exactly what is happening, the effect that is gonna, uh, is gonna, the impact that it's going to deliver and how we can respond to that. So a fundamental, uh, a fundamental point is making sure that we create an environment for us to be able to deploy those tools and make sure that there's coordination between all those who have to respond um, to this uh, to these events. I'll stop here. Thank, Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, and hi for highlighting technology and how we can use technology as well to to better manage our network and 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 make better decisions and kind of anticipate some of the the problems if if that possible. And Rafael, on the same point, um. And, and given that the importance of the transport infrastructure as a, as a very as essential service and how this as well the the, the resilient point of view and the the events of 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 um, of climate change I mean, can affect the sector. Yeah. I would like to to hear your points about that, your views. Well, uh, indeed, very important in our part of the world, and I would like to focus in particular in the Caribbean and also all the airports that are on the coastlines. Uh, Really, from the point of view of climate resilience, we have a big issue with uh, the impact of uh, of storm surges. In other words, with the rising sea level whenever there is a hurricane. We are not talking here about the long-term rising sea levels, but actually those that actually occur as a result of a storm. Uh, the Caribbean, as you very well know, uh, is, uh, you know, pounded by hurricanes every every season. Uh, and uh, the challenge here is to provide that protection, okay? There are airports that actually have already built those uh, walls, those sea walls, to prevent that uh, erosion, which is actually real. I've actually seen it myself in several of the airports, but still many, many, many airports have to do that. Um, my, may I remind you that most of the airports in the Caribbean are at sea level or even <laughs> under sea level. So really, this is absolutely important. From that point of view, I would say that it is very important to ensure that the master plans are in place and that these master plans are up to date. That is actually absolutely important. We actually see that the, many of the airports, and you actually made the distinction before, Anna, uh, between those which are in the private sector and those which are still in the public sector. Uh, those in the private sector, I would say that I'm not so worried about because, you know, they are basically handled and managed by professional companies. But many of those in the private, in the public sector, uh, they need uh, a lot of support from, from governments and things like, for example, as I say, ensuring that the master plans are up to date and ensuring that the operational plans are up to date. In other words, reviewing those plans on a, on a yearly basis is absolutely essential. And uh, we as, uh, you know, the International Airports Association, we try to help here. But I think that uh, organizations like the BID, you know, could actually help us uh, ensuring that this happens. So yes, protection is absolutely essential, uh, as I say, mainly from the uh, storm surge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rafael. I'm, I'm very like important point about planning and how having a, a good management system can help us uh, at least yeah to prevent and and how to have the professionally trained people and the systems in place um now we go to dionisio and um dionisio we, we talk about again about mit mitigation and why decarbonization has attracted a lot of attention from the cities I don't see as much interest or at least a uh, talk about resilience and adaptation to climate change. Um, how as well have, have you seen that from the organization, how the city is working on that like mix between 
adaptation and, and getting the, 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 the cities resilient to, to, to the changes that can happen as well, given climate change. Yeah, you are absolutely right. Uh, and it's also true that the region is increasingly experienced uh, a lot of uh, natural disasters. Eh? We can see that in uh, almost every week on the on, on the news. Yeah, so I think there are a few reasons for that. Uh, first is that adaptation is a relatively new concept. You no, know? so it takes time to to integrate all these climate considerations in the planning studies, in the processes, in the contracts, in the procurement, as colleagues were mentioning uh, before. Yeah. And also because you see, there are countries that are not considering, I would say, the basics. Yeah? They are not including public transport investments into their NDCs. They are not fixing any targets to reduce emissions from public transport interventions. So how on earth they, they, they might consider options like developing mapping, vulnerability systems, early warning systems, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? Uh, and also, I think we should, be, we should be all honest in that regard. There is still a lack of... Yeah, a lack of uh, cases of, of evidence regarding costs, benefits, impacts that make it easy to get the buy-in from, from politicians and decision makers. Yeah, it's always more interesting to, to, to get a mayor or minister to cut a ribbon for a new fleet of electric buses that to present the new infrastructure climate monitoring system, right? So all in all, again, we are we are optimistic. We see things moving all around the world. Uh, more and more cities and more and more public transport uh, operators are realizing that the public transport infrastructure needs, needs to be not only operated and maintained, but also designed and developed to meet these, uh, these uh, conditions. Yeah? And we are collecting those evidences in order to raise awareness with city officials and national governments. Uh, definitely training and upskilling across organizations is, uh, is critically uh, important. But all in all, the, the signals we are receiving confirm uh, a very positive trend. Thank you, Dionisio. And yeah, uh, we were just looking at the city of Panama, for example, that is very, and how they very uh, open to start working on this, how to make the, the infrastructure more resilient, for example, in preparation for the electromobility, because that's, you need, a better infrastructure, drainage, everything from being able to the electric buses to operate. So that that's very important for for us to help prepare the cities for this challenge. And 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 last but not least, um, Ingrid, uh, going back to mitigation, I would like to ask you about um, what role can economic measures play in global sectors such as maritime transport and and the agenda of decarbonization. Yes, so um, let me mention, I'm taking this uh, this webinar from Athens in Greece. Uh, we just closed our um, Global Maritime Forum annual summit where we had more than 200 uh, leaders from the maritime sector. So including ship owners and cargo owners, ports, uh, financial institutions and so on. Uh, and I can say that there is a strong support for economic measures uh, in uh, in the shipping sector from from the industry um i think that they uh, see that it would it would be uh, really helpful in leveling the playing field because the new fuels are going to be between two and four times more expensive than than the, the, the conventional fuels so it would be really key for leveling the playing field um, in addition, economic measures have the potential to generate revenue, and I think that that's something that would be of particular relevance to uh, to uh, develop to um, uh, redirecting funds to, for example, developing countries and including those that are loca located uh, uh, on a remote distance from their markets. So uh, I I foresee that it's a, there's an, an important role for economic measures. Um, I would also like to emphasize that from the industry perspective, the preference would be to have a global economic measure. But if that doesn't happen at the International Maritime Organization, I think that we will have economic measures being imposed by different regions. And I think that that's something that would be more difficult for the industry to manage. And I think we would also miss out on the uh, this opportunity to raise revenue that can then be redirected to developing countries. Thank you, thank you, Ingrid. And I mean, as always, we run out of time, and it's been a very important and and and, and 
like exciting conversation about about transport and decarbonization and every all the every all the measures and and roles that our organizations can can uh, develop in order to help Latin America and the Caribbean to advance. Um, I don't want to take much more time. Uh, I just would like to conclude to make thank you and thank everyone for joining today. We have more than two hundred uh, participants uh, for the whole hour, and I just want to emphasize three messages. The first one is that transport is an essential service. Sometimes when we talk about decarbonization, lots of people think about that it's a choice, no? Like to stop building infrastructure or stop uh, mo moving from one place to the other. And, and it's important that we emphasize as a sector that transport is important for services, for people, is uh, giving accessibility to populations, moving the goods. Uh, for us in the sector, it's like, uh, it, it, of course, for us, it's a, a something that we don't doubt but in the in when we talk about climate change and decarbonization sometimes transport sectors is demonized and i think for us the importance to 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 say and and to acknowledge the importance of our sector and so it's no if transport is important but how we can make it better how we can make decarbonize decarbonize the sector provide better services make it more resilient resilient how we can help the government institution regulations and work with the private sector in order to make this happen. So thank you everyone. This is just one of many events. Thank you for joining us. I hope we can keep this discussion and, and take it to the countries, take it to the cities and help them to, to move into the right direction. Thank you everyone. I hope to see you soon again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you Bye -bye. everyone.